Hello and welcome to the programme. Now, millions of citizens across Europe are electing 751 members to the European Parliament for five-year terms, with the number of seats for each nation determined primarily by population. Now, preliminary election results will be announced, hopefully, on May the 26th to discuss the possible of the European uh, Parliament election results and the outcomes. We're joined in the studio today by Serhi Garasimchuk. He's a member of the board at Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prison. Uh, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for inviting. Uh, so, in fact, usually um, European elections, uh, they're quite boring. But this time, there's so many factors at play there. And uh, there's a lot of uh, different um, sort of concerns of voters in different countries. There's not just sort of one single issue across the European Union that affects different people. So can you tell us, firstly, a bit about the main issues which are being discussed, especially in Eastern Europe? Well, well, it, it really, European elections this year are really interesting because that's the period of uh, big rotations in the European Union establishment. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a rotation of the European Parliament, elections of the new European President, President of the European Commission, and also of the President of the Council. Mm -hmm. Besides, there is also election of the head of the European Central Bank. And that gives a broad, broad uh, field for bargaining between different shareholders. Uh, shareholders and uh, uh, first, uh, we should talk probably about uh, political forces, mm. and indeed the uh, EPP, European People's Party, still has the best chances to get the biggest faction in, yeah. in the. But they're the majority at the moment. Yeah, yeah, but, but it won't be enough to, to to shape the coalition, even with their traditional allies from Social Democrats. Mm. So they they're gonna find somebody else to join them, and most probable candidate for that is uh, Alliance for Liberal Democrats. However, however, there is a question about it because both EBP and Social Democrats are in favor of so-called Spitzenkandidat mm. uh, procedure for electing the president of the European Commission, whereas Alde is not that much in favor of it. Basically, Macron explicitly rejected it. So it's interesting whether the coalition with Alde in will follow the Spitzenkandidat procedure. If they will, then the best chances are for Manfred Weber, mm. who is representing EPP, who is the head of EPP in the European Parliament. If not, then there, there, there is a question, because there are going to be a lot of speculations who is going to, to, to elect. Yeah. I, I mean, according to the treaties, that's the prerogative of the Council. Mm. However, they have to consider the position of the European Parliament. And the European Parliament has already said that it won't support anybody who was not a Spitzenkandidat. So, so. <laughs> So it's sort of complicated. Yeah. Uh, another novel, uh, another story behind that is uh, the competition between uh, pro-European forces and so-called anti-European forces. Well, well, I wanted to ask you about this, yeah. actually, John. <laughs> so so, so, so the, the point is that EPP, uh, Social Democrats, ARDA are sort of traditionalist political forces in the European Parliament. On the other hand, we have a so-called attempt to make so-called united right, mm. which will which will assemble the political parties that are belonging to right spectrum of the political... And these are largely Eurosceptic yep. parties. Yep, exactly. Although there, there, there is def different level of scepticism. Mm. For example, uh, currently the, the front runner is uh, uh, um, Salvini, Matteo mm. Salvini, vice yeah. prime minister of, of Italy, who is uh, sort of leader of this right, and uh, he was already endorsed by German Alternative for Germany, AfD. Mm. He was already uh, endorsed by Marie Le Pen. Uh, then we have uh, European conservatives and reformists, mm. mainly c c containing uh, British conservatives mm. and, and Kaczynski, uh, his Prawa and Sprawiedliwość political force from Poland. So, so he is also Eurosceptic, but he is also anti-Russian, which doesn't give him a possibility to join this coalition. And then we have uh, Viktor Orban from Hungarian Fidesz, who yeah. until recently was a member of EPP, but now he is expelled from EPP. So, so, so he is looking for, for the opportunities uh, for other political families to join. And uh, on the one hand, uh, Salvini looks good for him, if because Salvini is 
probably the guy who will win more seats for, for, for the United Right. However, the ambition of Orban is that high that I believe that perhaps it would be not enough of space for them, for two leaders, two charismatic leaders in, in, in this political force. Mm. So the question is where Orban will go and how many votes he will get at the European elections. Yeah, and it's also quite difficult as well because I would imagine that apart from being united on being Eurosceptic, <laughs> actually a lot of these uh, anti establishment parties um, are they they have different priorities in when you compare sort of the the groups in Italy compared to the groups in Poland yes uh, plus uh, back to Orban he said that he is ready to support Salvini but only in one issue in the, mm. on the issue on, of migration well exactly migration yeah. is a big issue that they can unite on but on others they don't yeah yeah and, and these uh, vectors of uh, pro, pro european pro western or pro russian like, like salvini is pro russian marie le pen is explicitly mm. pro russian but kaczynski is not and, and will never be i guess exactly yeah so this is the problem that they face and whatever the result is we expect that the european union will be weakened somehow is that how you would forecast it? Uh, yes that's true that's mm. true because uh, although we will anyway have coalition of pro-European forces, uh, they, they will be weaker. Uh, plus, it, it will be interesting to follow the line of Greens, of European Greens, because there are two, two groups of European Greens, uh, Nordic Greens and just Greens. Like uh, I read that they're, quite, they're doing quite well in Germany at the moment. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and they're, they're, they're rising right now. Mm. Uh, and I, I have a feeling that, that even in, in the German Bundestag, that they were like trying, if Greens will join or not the coalition with yeah. CDU, CSU. So, so, so it's very interesting game. Like it's probably even even more interesting than the last season of the Game of Thrones. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. I haven't seen it, but well, let's see about that. Um, we actually have a soundbite from an analyst. I think from the European Policy Center, if I remember uh, correctly. So I think we can have a listen to him now. Yeah, sure. EU business will become more complicated in the future. The European Parliament elections will show that critical anti-forces will do well in many member states, anti-EU, anti-Euro, anti-migration, anti-pluralist. Many of these forces will do very well. They won't have a majority in the European Parliament, um, but they will affect um, the discourse in the member states increasingly. So there we go. So that was just one analyst uh, talking there about sort of the anti-EU, anti-Euro, anti-migration. So what does that mean um, for Ukraine and Ukraine's link to the European Union? Because fundamentally, they've actually, Ukraine has had a lot of support in the European Parliament. That's absolutely true. European Parliament was very supportive towards Ukraine since 2014, and there were many declarations and resolutions of the European Parliament, mm. uh, in particular those dealing with Russia, Russian occupation of Crimea, human rights in, in Crimea, and the occupied territories. But I, I, I do believe that, that having the majority of uh, ALDEP plus S and DEP plus EPP will still be beneficial for Ukraine, and they, they will still shape the agenda. Plus, it's very interesting to follow who, who will be at the head of the European Commission and who will be the European uh, EU Foreign Affairs representative. And how is that decided? I mean, th that's not an election, <laughs> right? The, the, the head of the... Uh, the... The head of the European Commission is nominated by the European Council, but mm. it has to be supported by the European Parliament. Uh, uh, then uh, we, we, same, same same is true for for the high representative on foreign affairs, and uh, in case uh, it will be uh, Franz Timmermans from from uh, uh, Social Democrats, yeah. it, it won't be bad. Uh, I mean, he's a very experienced diplomat. Uh, and again, if uh, Manfred Weber is elected as the president of the, the European Commission, it's going to be good for Ukraine as well because he, he explicitly said that he is against Nord Stream too, mm. and that's that, that's interconnected with the elections to the. European European Parliament. Uh, it's also interesting who will be at the head of, of the Council, because uh, Donald Tusk has to leave soon as yeah, of well. Course. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he already said that he would prefer somebody from a smaller, weaker country. But, but, but I, I, I have a feeling that, that there, is, uh, there is a race between a uh, few representatives, few interested parties. I, I guess Mark Rutte has the ambition, also he, he denies it, but, yeah. but, but still I, I believe he has the ambition. And uh, also it's interesting what would be, uh, who, who would be the president of the parliament. Mm. Uh, and if, uh, if we do not have Manfred Weber as the head of the commission, then most probably he will go for the head of the parliament, which is not, the, not bad for us as well. Yes, because yeah. of his explicitly, well, his position is less 
pro-Russian than of some members of his political party even. Yes, yeah, interesting. And also, uh, the recent uh, political bombshell that we had was that Theresa May is resigning. And uh, I know that in the UK, um, people the, the turnout for the European elections is usually a lot lower than, for example, the general elections. So it'd be good to talk about the situation in the UK, because I really think this sort of um, projects across Europe as well. But before we talk, we have a soundbite from Theresa May, who gave her farewell address, or at least the first one of them, uh, re earlier on. So let's have a listen. I will shortly leave the job that it has been the honour of my life to hold the second female Prime Minister, but certainly not the last. I do so with no ill will, but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. There we go. There was a very uh, teary uh, Theresa May there. Very uh, surprising, actually. I don't think she's ever cried in her political career and uh, probably never seen it in the European Parliament either. <laughs> but um, how do you think that uh, you know, Brexit and these big issues are affecting the elections? Well, there is no direct effect on the elections because since Britain didn't leave, uh, mm. you still participate. Brits still participate in yes. the elections and will be represented. Much to the in, anger in, of uh, many Brits, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> well, the point is that there is a sort of informal agreement that, that the United Kingdom will not participate in elections of the key positions for the European Union, like European Commission President or the head of the European Council, uh, which is fair because mm. if you leave then then, then why, why, why should you have impact on, on such uh, appointments mm. uh, so so it's very dramatic that britain leaves and uh, I, I would say that uh, ecr european conservatives and reformists well also pro ukrainian i'm i mean british conservatives together with polish uh, conservatives uh, they, they, they are our allies ukrainian mm. allies uh, however if it will change, I, I do not see like very dramatic changes because anyway, Salvini won't be the head of the European Commission and will mm. not uh, rule the majority. Yes, yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much thank for you. coming into our studios. And of course, we'll have the uh, results in. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll hear from you uh, soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, Sehi Garasimchuk, a member of the board at Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prison. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more here on UATV.